I don't know if it was our first time doing that type of uh, with the, with that with the with this group in that style. I was glad to hear it worked out. Um, so the next half of this presentation or of tonight, we've got a couple speakers. Um, uh, our first speaker, James Chu, with Haven and Florin. Um, I met him a few months ago. He's actually also a Sac State alumni, and where I met him was at a Sac State alumni like roundtable panel discussion. And he was on the panel, and he was talking, and I was like, wow, this guy knows his shit. And um, so I've had a couple meetings with him since then. I know a little bit. <laughs> He's done some cool stuff. I was like, we've got to get him in the program. So I asked him, and he said yes. And uh, I think you guys will like what he has to say. And if not, then oh well, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll hand it over to James. Yeah. Yeah. You can do the mic. Over. Can, uh, can you guys hear me if I just talk about the mic? Or, we yeah. prefer not to use the mic. Just kind of want. Just kind of wants to use the mic. Yeah. So if like you guys want to get a little closer or something. Yeah, that's a good idea. That way, that way it's a little bit more intimate. Things like that. Um, so, I've never done anything like this before, um, so I want to thank Eric and the Hacker Lab community for giving me this opportunity to uh, have a captive audience to listen to me talk about Pokemon Go um, and the basics of Pokemon Go and how to capture a Dragon Knight. Yes! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I knew more. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was a great icebreaker. So anyways, um, the reason why Eric is having me here is because from my understanding last week, you guys talked about and learned about um, design thinking, right? Um, and how to like essentially use data-driven uh, design methods towards creating a product and minimize your chances of uh, failing. So that's why I'm here to kind of share my experiences and how I was able to kind of utilize design thinking to start a company and to keep growing from it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My throat's a little sore, so I gotta keep drinking water. So, my name is James Chu. Uh, I graduated from Sac State uh, with a degree in criminal justice. Um, and somehow, I managed to learn enough about product design to become a founder of Haven and Florin. Uh, what is Haven and Florin? So, my company, Haven & Florin, we design and manufacture uh, high-end, rugged, uh, versatile backpacks for the modern creative and traveler. Um, we launched about exactly six months ago, actually, with one product. And since then, we sold, I want to say, close a little over 500 bags. Um, and they've been all over the world with our customers. And... Um, What's up? Oh, the mic? Okay, yeah, no worries. We'll do that. Was the mic very close to me? Yeah, I can't hear I'll get you a good... That was it, for sure. Oh, it should work fine. Oh, let's see. Hello? 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 Does that work? Yeah, it's here? Okay, cool. So... Currently, for Haven and Florin, we're in the process of expanding and getting ready to launch our second product. Um, and we're also getting ready to enter a new market, which is Japan. And after Japan, we're, well, currently we're in talks with a large Japanese distributor. So, uh, you know, after Japan, we're hoping to get into the rest of Asia, um, just because our product resonates really well with the customers over there. Um, so, anyways, it's a really exciting time for us, uh, for Haven Florin, but honestly the truth is it took us about two years of researching and learning all the skills we needed to finally get to this stage where we can launch our first product and uh, with that first product enable us to keep growing. Um, so the story of Haven of Foreign started uh, about two years ago. I was fresh out of college, just graduated Sac State. I moved to New York City and I worked as a photographer, a wedding photographer. 
And so I traveled everywhere. I know, white photography, that has nothing to do with criminal justice. But yeah. anyways, so I traveled a lot. And uh, one of the things I noticed that I was doing a lot was I would start wrapping my camera equipment up with sweaters and I would throw that inside of backpacks. And you're probably wondering, why did I use a camera bag? Well, camera bags, I hated camera bags because number one, they're unattractive, they're bulky, and they're extremely obvious. So it's like wearing a lunch pail, essentially, and you're kind of advertising to the world, hey, can you please steal this $3,000 camera I have on me? And the number two thing is I hated carrying two bags with me whenever I travel. It's just kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm lazy, maybe, maybe it's just not practical. So anyways, eventually I ended up buying a lunch pail with uh, padded inserts and I actually stuck my camera into the lunch pail and I stuck the lunch pail into my backpack, my North Face backpack. And that's when it kind of hit me. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if I had a backpack that was versatile enough where I can fit my camera gear in it and it came with a removable compartment where once I didn't need my camera gear, I can just remove it and uh, use it as a normal backpack for my daily needs. And um, so I think one night, I'm pretty sure it was this night, I was in Brooklyn and I just finished going out to the bars and things like that. And I decided while still drunk that I should actually try to create this backpack and I should maybe start my own company. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what I was really thinking about at the time. I was just like, hey, I got this cool idea. I have this problem and I want to do something about it. Um, so to be honest, I had no idea where to start when I first uh, decided this. There was no such thing as a startup hustle that you guys are in right now, so I couldn't find one. So I had no idea where to start. And I eventually found the small website called Alibaba. And, yeah. and I found a Chinese factory that said that they could turn my crude napkin sketches into a prototype. And so this complete stranger from the other side of the world by the name of Sam Smith, and their, their name really was Sam Smith, and they said, hey, send us $600, to wire it to us, and we'll make you the prototype. And so I did it. I sent them $600, and after about three weeks, I was thinking to myself, I'm pretty sure I got scammed. I haven't heard back from them. So, anyways, don't do that. <laughs> don't go on Alibaba and send a stranger six hundred dollars. <laughs> however, however, thankfully, after about like two months, a package arrives, uh -huh. and Yay. it was a sample. <laughs> so, with the sample, I somehow put together a a Kickstarter campaign uh, that failed, and I don't think I. I don't think I told you about this, did I, Eric? No, okay. So I don't really tell anyone about this Kickstarter campaign because over the, over the course of the couple of years, I, I have this new skill, which is selective memory. So I try to like block it out sometimes. But um, honestly, failing, that Kickstarter failing was probably the best thing to ever happen to Haven of Foreign and uh, for myself. Um, because it gave me this reality check that I really needed. It helped me realize that I can't just throw together a product and expect other people to love it, right? I, just based off of my own needs and my own predictions, I put together a product and I was just throwing it out there and hoping, hey, why don't you guys love this product, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And that's why data-driven design is very important, and that's what you guys learned about last week. So, I'll get some water. So anyways, <clears throat> after a failed Kickstarter campaign, I was 
pretty miserable. I spent the next two weeks walking around Manhattan trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do. And my logic told me I should try and immerse myself in this industry, in this environment, by working for a company that's relevant to what I'm doing, or at least getting an internship. Um, so I ended up writing up like 50 emails or something like that. And I sent out my resume and my little shiny cover letters to all of them. And I heard back from none of, none of them. So, I mean, surprise. <laughs> Anyways, New York City is a pretty competitive place. And because I didn't have any formal background in design or fashion, I added no value to any of these companies. But that's fine because, you know, I decided I'm not going to give up. It's okay. I'm just going to self-fund Haven of Florin with my siblings and create my own internship so I can learn all the stuff that I need uh, and figure out how to launch a product on my own. And, um, I mean, I seriously spent countless all-nighters just watching YouTube videos reading Reddit forums and trying to figure out where all the puzzle pieces went. Um, anyways, I didn't know this until very recently when I was talking to Eric that this is the part where uh, design thinking came into play and that uh, everything that I started doing moving forward from that day uh, was part of the design thinking process. Um, and because now that Haven Foreign is self-funded as opposed to crowdfunded, uh, we didn't have any money at all. So it was really important for me to do the homework and to figure out what does our consumer need or what are their needs, how do I design a product around them and make sure that it succeeds. Because um, the last thing I want to do is be broke and be stuck with a product that I can't sell at all. And that is a very bad situation to be in. <clears throat> so anyways, I began my process by looking at my competitors. I started looking at their websites and I started trying to figure out which competitor that I, that I admired the most uh, based off of their product design, uh, their branding and their customer base. And so the company that I determined uh, that I admired the most was uh, Fall Raven. Does anyone know what Fall Raven is? It's, it's really popular in the, in the East Coast, but maybe not up here. But we'll say Patagonia, just for the sake of you guys relating to it. So, what was that? North Face. Yeah. North Face, North Face, okay. North Face. So I started looking up North Face, and I started looking at their customer base, but you can only go so far by studying their customer base, right? Because I didn't have access to any of them to ask them questions and to obtain the data that I needed to create a product. And so what I like to do is I like to actually go on their website and I'll click on store locator or whatever page they have that they list all of the stores that carry their products. And I started making a list and I would actually go to these stores and I would start talking to all the salespeople about the products. Um, yeah, I'd like make a list, um, drive out there, just pretend I'm a customer. Um, so, the stores that I preferred the most during this whole process is I like to talk to the smaller locally owned businesses. And the reason for that is because smaller businesses, they don't have a ton of money to, to spend. And so all of their products are usually curated. And so when they curate their products, they know way more about these products that they're carrying. <clears throat> and they essentially are experts at what their customers want and what their customers need. <clears throat> so for me, I would just walk in. Um, I didn't like to tell them from the get-go that, hey, like I'm, I'm making a backpack or I'm starting a backpack company. Can you help me out with some feedback or tips or advice or 
you know, what's up? I instead would walk in, pretend I'm a customer, and I would ask them questions like, uh, like, hey, uh, what's the best selling backpack right now, and why, and what makes that backpack so great and unique about it? And there were times when we were at this phase where we were trying to determine the color palette for uh, our products. And so I would go into a lot of stores and I would pretend to be this like very unoriginal customer who just wants to buy whatever's like trendy and whatever pe other people are buying. So I would go and be like, hey, what's the most popular color for guys because I want that bag? Or I would have my girlfriend go in and ask them, hey, what's the most popular colors for girls? And that's how we kind of got this data. And it was all possible because by posing as a customer, they want to sell you on this product. And so they'll start telling you all the selling points and all the features. And they've done this hundreds of times with other people, right? Because they're the experts at this. So that's what I did. Um, <clears throat> So eventually, after doing this enough times, you kind of start to have a pretty good idea and understanding of what your target audience wants and what sells and what works in the real market. And one of the um, interesting points that I discovered for our company, at least, and for our product, is that people actually care about where these bags are made. Um, and it makes sense because when you're in the market for a high-end backpack that's high quality and rugged, there's this common perception that made in USA is very important. And made in USA means quality because over the years people start thinking like, oh, made in China overseas is just you know disposable goods. So that's... Based off of that data, we realized, okay, we have to go Made in USA now, uh, especially since we're in this higher-end um, carry goods industry. And so with that data, we actually started building our first uh, minimum viable product, which is a fancy term for a prototype. So Anyways, once you get that prototype, once we got our prototype, we started walking around just anywhere. And as soon as we saw someone wearing a North Face backpack, we would go up to them, tap them on the shoulder, and be like, hey, what do you like about your North Face backpack? And what do you think about our bag? And we would do that to as many people as we could. And I know it sounds pretty daunting to just walk up to strangers and things like that. But as long as you make the conversation about them, they're more than likely, I mean, they're, everyone likes to talk about themselves. So they'll just start telling you all this feedback and things like that, and you start showing them your bag or whatever product you have. And um, a tip is, I made it a huge point not to ever ask my friends or family for feedback on our prototypes. Because with friends and family, I could literally pull like a brick out of, out of like the backyard and be like, hey, what do you think about this? And they'll probably find something nice to say about it. Like, oh, that's very sturdy. I like how it's red. You know? <laughs> like things like that. So, and those are like false positives, right? You don't want that in your data. You want to, you don't want this type of data to skew it and to lead you to thinking, oh, like, Everyone likes this product, right? You want you want to face like the cold hard truth and get like the real data to make your product better. <coughs> so, anyways, after about doing this process, um, building a prototype, testing it, and we did it about three times until we finally arrived at a market ready sample. And with that sample came the ultimate test. And that ultimate Tesla is, I went back to all of the stores that I went to in the beginning before I even had a prototype, back when I was pretending to be a customer, and I would try to pitch the backpack to them instead. Because these people are experts, right? They know exactly what the market wants. They know exactly what the customer wants. And they do this every single day. 
So I would literally go in there and I would ask a store manager or anyone who has any decision making abilities and I would start pitching the bag to them. And to be honest, it sounds like a very, very scary thing to do just to like walk up to a store, ask for the manager or the owner. Uh, but you know, after a couple times, it's actually not that bad. Like for my first few times when I did that, I actually, I was so nervous that I couldn't zip up my own backpack all the way <laughs> as I was demonstrating it. So I was like shutting them in the bag and I couldn't zip it up. And I had like my camera falling down. <laughs> like that. So it was like, it was a disaster, but from that, I found that generally they were all very welcoming and they all provided very, very valuable feedback. And the best part about this was I actually ended up getting purchase orders out of it. So not only did I get very valuable data, but now you're putting yourself out there, you're putting this product out there and they're like, hey, how much is it? Can we write you a check? Can we give you a deposit now? And we'll give you the rest on delivery or whatever your terms are, which is a whole nother topic. So maybe you guys can start talking about terms and stuff and another thing. But anyways, sorry. Next program. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so that's how I validated my product. And that's how I knew that my product is finally ready to go into mass production. As soon as I got the green light and the approval from store owners and store managers who have seen this product from other people thousands of times, but they're willing to put their money on my product and, and put it at, in their store and sell it because they believe in the product and they know that the product can sell. So that was, for us, like that was the green light and that's the validation that we were looking for. And that's how we knew, you know what, like we're done with our process. It's time to go into production. Um, <clears throat> so after that whole process, it, it can be pretty tedious. You'll probably, a lot of times at best, you'll probably go through like two prototypes at least. If you're working on something that's like a physical product, it'll be at least two prototypes. Um, but anyways, so after launching, um, we've been keeping track of every single piece of feedback and every email we get from our customers and non-customers. And um, the whole design thinking process gets a lot easier once you start growing a fan base and once you start putting this product out there. Um, you know, for our expansion, right now we're getting ready to launch our second product. For our second product, we didn't just, you know, go out of blind. We utilized data-driven design and we actually sent a survey out to every single one of our customers. And then we also sent a separate survey to all of our, uh, all of the people on our emailing list who weren't customers yet. And we would ask them questions like, hey, like, how do you use our backpack? And how do you like it so far? How can we improve upon it? And for our non-customers, we would ask them questions like, what type of features do you want to see? What would convert you into a buyer? Because obviously they're already interested in our product, but there is missing something, which is why they you know, only subscribe for updates, but they're not buying it. So we sent out all those surveys and we tried to collect, collect as much data as possible. And also, once you start selling products, you can also look at your customers and you can also figure a lot of stuff out based off of that. So for us, um, our first backpack was on the larger end because I designed it kind of around my back, which is, you know, my the backpack was pretty big and we got our first and only return so far about two months ago uh, from a lady in San Francisco. And she said she loved the product. She loved everything about it. The only thing that is hard for her is that she wants to be able to wear it every single day, but it was just too big for her. 
um, because she said she's a girl and she is about 5'3 tall. And then I start looking at our data and I realize about 65% of our customers are actually females. And so you look at data like that and then we start thinking, okay, you know what? <clears throat> For our next bag, we need to downsize a little bit, make it more friendly and make it more appealing to them as well. And ultimately, I mean, that's how we're able to launch Haven of Florin and get to the point where we're ready to expand again in six months. It's all thanks to utilizing design thinking. And especially for a small startup like us, we really can't afford to launch a product and have it flop. Because if we do, then that's the end of our company. So we have to utilize this, this method, which is data-driven design, and make sure that every single product that we launch will succeed. And that's it. for women or are you generating new sizes, like a small, medium, large, or are you labeling it, are you anticipating labeling it as male, female? So that's a really good question. Um, because this company is very bootstrapped and we are trying to invest all our money back into growing, we actually can't afford to have multiple sizes. I mean, we're not like Jansport or North Face where we can afford to like have you know, small, medium, large. And so we kind of had to get a lot of data. One of the questions that we asked people um, was, what's their height? So that was actually very valuable to us because we're able to kind of get an average of what everyone's height is. And we were able to kind of create our next backpack that's suitable for this, this uh, range of height. So yeah. How did you go about uh, getting your customers again? I didn't really get that part. Getting our customers? Yeah. Oh, like how did we, like after we launched and things like that? Yeah, like how did you get the your customers? So one thing that's very helpful, and um, this is kind of generalized because I don't believe that social media is suitable for all businesses. But for my business in particular, since it's more lifestyle oriented, um, what I did was <laughs> I, I went back to looking at my competitors and I went on their social media accounts and I looked at all the hashtags that they started using. And I started using those same hashtags and essentially I started poaching their customers <laughs> because they would go on their Instagram and their hashtags and they would look at their stuff because they already found their company, right? And then they would start seeing you know, foreign stuff popping up and they're like, well, this is something that I would wear too, right? Because again, we're targeting a specific audience. And so they would see our stuff and then essentially that's how we kind of start getting the word out. Another thing that helped a lot for us personally was uh, we started finding ambassadors around the world. So we have ambassadors in like Iceland, um, Australia, <coughs> Japan, and things like that. And these people are usually influencers who have a large following. And people can't say no to free stuff. So when I'm like, hey, do you want a free bag? They're like, sure. So <laughs> it sounds a lot easier than it is, but you know, over time you'll kind of get a better understanding of it. And currently what we're doing right now is um, we're starting again to more traditional advertising. So we're gonna start doing like Instagram ads, Facebook ads, uh, Google AdWords and things like that. And they're actually the teaching, a, they're teaching a class right now on the, actually, on, on Facebook advertising. Yeah. He's really good. Are you serious? Yeah. We do it every month. Yeah, he's really good, so. So yeah, any other questions? We have a sample piece for sure. Oh yeah, so beautiful bag. Wow. So this is one of our uh, prototypes right now for our second bag. This is actually market ready almost. Um, I'm gonna be finalizing the details. So we work with military contractors and uh, factories in the U.S. 
So everything down to like the fabric is made in USA and also military grade. So we're gonna be finalizing the details uh, of this bag in two weeks uh, with our factory in LA. So, um, so we're probably gonna go with all black. They actually messed up and used all green for this one, yeah. which is fine. Like yeah, it's, it's kind of like yeah, more of good. a military look. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, all of our bags feature a back opening and also a secret pocket on the bottom. So when you're traveling and things like that, you can kind of tuck your passport away from the bottom and people can't access it. So those are some of the things that we asked our, we surveyed people and they loved it. And that's actually the biggest selling point um, for a lot of um, you know stores and people that we've talked to. As soon as we showed them those two features, that was it for them. <laughs> so that's why it's good to talk to people. It never hurts to ask. What's that thing at the top? Like, what is that? That round? What is that? Thing? Oh, this is a this one is a roll top, and essentially when it rolls over, it also covers these pockets from the front as well. Um, our design aesthetic is very minimal and sleek. Uh, one of the interesting things that we learned from talking to our customers is that a lot of them couldn't fit a bigger water bottle in their backpacks. And so with that data, we decided to design a pocket from the side that kind of expands out accordion style but without having to use like that mesh that can kind of get caught in things and stuff like that. So yeah, any, any other questions? Well, how much is, what's your price point? Right now, this one we're thinking about, we're trying to be more competitive. Um, we're thinking about 160 or 180, and that would be more competitive uh, compared to like Patagonia and things like that. They're actually manufactured overseas, so. Yeah, hey, what's up? What's your cost of production for you? So our cost of production per unit, um, that is a very, very good question because when you're, make, when you're manufacturing in the USA, <laughs> expect to pay at least twice or if not three times what you're gonna pay in Asia. So right now for these backpacks, uh, we're really trying to get the price down. Um, so price per unit as of right now, we're able to get it down to about uh, $60 a piece which isn't too bad for many USA, uh, considering it's all you know military grade materials and stuff like that. Oh, okay. yep. Have you ever considered selling to the state or the military? You know, that's, uh, I've thought about that before. I've actually thought about doing some white label uh, designing for like government contracts and stuff like that. Um, just because I do a lot of research on bags and what's like the newest technology and things like that. Um, Contracts are very, very difficult to navigate with the military and the government. So, uh, probably not anytime soon. If you know somebody, or I know somebody that can help you with that. Oh, nice. Cool, so yeah. Then there's, a, there's obviously a regulatory uh, yeah. knowledge that you need to know in order to win those contracts. Yeah. If that's something you're interested in. Yeah, that, I mean, that would be a pretty cool idea. I mean, a lot of the factors we work with they already manufacture a lot of military bags uh, based on contracts and it's crazy because the bags that they manufacture for the military they sell it back to the government for like anywhere from like four to eight hundred dollars for a backpack and that's to me like that's crazy <laughs> so once you get one it's a perpetual state of business <laughs> right 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 so so quick tip guys if you can get a government contract do it, do it. <laughs> hey, you'll be done. You'll be done. You'll be set for life. So, yep. so I see on your website that you're, you you sell direct and you sell through retail. How do how do you deal with pricing conflicts or channel conflicts? That so, <laughs> this is really funny. Um, what was the question? So the question is, I sell online direct and I also sell through retailers. Okay. Um, so when we first started, we did some like orders for like. Uh, boutiques and stores like that and then we ended up stopping uh, the wholesale because we couldn't make our first uh, product cheap enough where it's viable for us um, so we kind of stopped doing that we went all direct but we've been working with new factories and kind of getting more creative with the way we design so one of the things uh, we started doing is I start designing parts that are inter interchangeable with other products. So like the shoulder straps are all the same, left and right, and also for other products that we're gonna be uh, featuring in the future. 
and things like that to kind of minimize um, the cost of everything. And so now that we're able to do that, we're starting to revisit wholesale. And um, for the most part with wholesale, we're not making that much money. We're making like maybe $20 off of each bag. However, however, with that being said, with wholesale, we treat it as more like marketing. Um, that's kind of more of our marketing budget. So we send out these stores, maybe like three or four or five bags. And so they can do the sales for us. They can sell it to other people. And most people, most consumers, they go to the store to try stuff on, to see if they like it, and then they order online. So that's generally how, you know, from our experience, that's how it's been done. So we're willing to kind of take the little hit here and there, because we're still breaking even, we're still making a little bit of money, but the exposure and having someone who knows your product and selling it to someone else, that's where the value comes in. And, Essentially, it's like we're hiring them as salespeople. So, yeah. So, you kind of have to like, get a little creative with that type of stuff. So, you have to deal with like minimum advertising price, the price that kind of thing? Minimum what? Min minimum advertising price because, you know, your, your bag's going for 240 mm -hmm. They want 50 points of margin, so they're selling it to, to them for 125 Right, so um, what they call that in the industry is keystone pricing. So okay. essentially with keystone pricing, whatever your MSRP is, uh -huh. you have to sell it to them for half and they essentially buy it for half and then they double up on it. Right. And that's generally like what most stores will do unless you're working with like a large retailer with a lot of buying power. Uh, for example, let's say you're trying to get a Target. Well, Target is not gonna provide you keystone pricing or they're not going to want keystone pricing. They're going to want at least, you know, two, three hundred percent profit on, you know, buying it wholesale and then selling MSRP. So that's why a lot of companies are forced to go, um, you know, made in China or made overseas. So, yeah. Did you? Yeah. Um, you mentioned you collected uh, the data on your customer's height. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, I was just curious when you calculated the average of your customer's height, did you compare it to like a national average? I'm just wondering like how different that would be. Yeah, you know, that's actually really funny. I didn't think about that comparing it to a national average. Um, I was just really focused on our target audience and our own consumers. Um, possibly I could see how that's very beneficial because you obviously want as big of an audience as possible, right? And make it very general for a lot of people. But the reality is it's better to focus on the people who are important and relevant to your business. So, yeah. Anything else? Cool. Well, thanks for. Uh, oh, are you planning to expand with the budget you have? I mean, like you know, the financing and all this stuff. So the way we're expanding is currently we are reinvesting everything back into uh, manufacturing and production, and also being able to prototype things and figuring out how to make things more efficiently. It, when you're in Made in USA, every single pocket you add will add another. 10 15 dollars to the end cost of a product so it's very expensive and so you really have to like do your research figure out what type of crap people don't need and a lot of times you'll see like north face backpacks or patagonia where they're made in overseas and you could add like 20 pockets to a backpack it'll probably change the price difference by like two dollars but that's not the case here and so the only way to really reduce the cost of our product is to figure out how to make it more efficiently so, yeah. So, when you move to other uh, geographies, like say you said Japan, is Made in USA still important to that? You know, it's pretty funny. So, we got in touch with a large Japanese distributor who distributes um, Tom's and, and Burton and things like that out in Japan. And he was telling us that in Japan, their culture values quality and they are willing to pay a premium for anything that is quality and that's why the interesting part about japan and starting in also other parts of asia now like hong kong and stuff they really like made in usa products 
because everyone kind of thinks and has this common perception and, and understanding that made in USA means quality. So yeah. So eventually you'll you know meet a distributor and you can ask them a lot of good questions about their regions and you know they're the experts at that. So yeah. And how did you get uh, feedback from your non-customers? Did you send them like you, know, you said these you, you emailed out your mailing list? Right. You know, like, didn't buy, but did you send like a survey or just like flat out? Hi, Joe. <laughs> um, I just sent a survey. So a lot of times you can automate this. Um, you can use services like Mailchimp and things like that, and you can actually separate people who purchased and people who just subscribed because they're interested. And so you kind of separate the two groups and then you kind of target them individually with questions catered to you know those people. So it was all automated. I, I didn't have time to go through <laughs> like all these emails and stuff like that. And how did you go about building that email before you had product? The email list? Yeah. Did everybody hear that question? Like how do you go about like actually building your email list? So the interesting thing about uh, Kickstarter was I realized right before we were about to fail <laughs> that once you fail you have no communication at all with um, the people who backed your project and so I ended up sending them uh, to a website I built a website in like a week and I sent it to them and I had them start subscribing to it for updates and then also with um, our prototypes, even our like minimum minimum viable prototypes, uh, I started sending it out to people like influencers and having them take pictures of it and like put it up on their uh, Instagrams and things like that. And you know, like uh, in a picture, you can't really tell about the product as long as it kind of looks like the end goal that you're trying to achieve, you're good. So with a little bit of Photoshop magic. I'm able to kind of like change the colors of the backpack, even though I only had one bag and things like that, and uh, and you know get the word out, and people started uh, subscribing because it would be like, oh, like you know, subscribe now and launch. We're gonna launch soon, and if you subscribe now, we'll offer you a you know a discount and things like that. I also noticed the discounts works very well. So in the very beginning, we were like, you know what, if you subscribe now, we'll send you. Um, a code for 15% off to use later on, and things like that. And that worked really well. How do you get your influencers to continually produce imagery or content? <laughs> so, when I first started doing that, I didn't have anything formal. Um, it was just kind of like scout's honor type of thing. Like, hey Joe, I'm gonna send you this bag because you said it's a cool bag. So once I sent it to you, uh, can you do a couple posts or can you send some photos? Um, from my experience, now that I know better, formalize it, like have a contract because there are, there have been uh, a lot of photographers who just wanted a bag and I foolishly sent them a bag and I got nothing out of it. However, at least they still wear it around. <laughs> so I guess like okay, it kind of works. But they didn't they didn't post on their Instagram. They didn't send me photos to use or anything like that. So really like you know when you're dealing with strangers, just formalize it. You know NDA or whatever you need to do, um, and also you know put it in a contract in writing that hey, once I send you the bag, you're gonna owe me. X amount of photos and X amount of posts on your Instagram or social media or whatever platform you're using. And is there a formula for that? Like, let's say they have 20,000 followers and you send them a $200 backpack. <laughs> is there a ratio so like $200, 20,000, three posts? So, if you get 200,000 followers, you get one post. I don't know. So, um, I noticed the more followers a person has, the stingier they are and the more jaded they are. <laughs> like because they're constantly approached by, you know, companies trying to like offer them free stuff and things like that. Um, so for a, a sweet spot that I've noticed is a 
approaching influencers with anywhere from 15 to about 40,000 followers because those are like every single time I've reached out to an influencer that's in that range they responded back and they were excited about it but once you start reaching out to like people of over 100,000 followers like they're expecting you to pay them a thousand dollars a post mm -hmm. so that is just like beyond the question but however one thing I do want to share with you guys is um, I'm starting to cut back on sending out products to influence, influencers because um, after Instagram uh, analytics came out and all that stuff I looked over the data and it doesn't convert as well as traditional advertising. So if I were to send a backpack to Joe with 20,000 followers and they do one post, I would say about maybe 5,000 people. There's about 5,000 impressions versus, so you know, now I'm out like a $200 backpack, right? Versus if I sp spent the same $200 and did Instagram advertising instead, I would have made like 50,000 impressions. So, you know, kind of look at the data. Everything is should be data driven, so yeah. So, I think that's it, right? Yeah, thanks guys. Sorry, but it's like yeah. eight thirty. People want to go home. You leave that back. Or you can like catch it up later. Uh, all right. So, Javi, uh, Javi is an alumni from our first startup hustle round. Yeah, and I think more and more this this uh, term, we're going to be trying to get alumni out and share their tips and and tricks what they learned. So he had a couple couple uh, pieces of feedback from his first round that he's willing to come out and share with you guys. So, Javi. All right, uh, thanks Eric. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about uh, the customer survey process really briefly. Um, has anyone started doing customer interviews already? Okay, you have. Okay, that's good. That would be my first piece of advice, uh, is to start as early as possible. Um, I don't know if it's been assigned like formally yet, uh, but in any case, uh, if you can, try and start doing those surveys as early as possible because uh, one thing that, that I think is a theme uh, in running a startup uh, is that the whole thing's an iterative, iterative process, right? Like you keep uh, making changes as time goes on. Uh, you know, you release a, a beta, you get some feedback, and then you use that to redesign your product. And I would say the same is true with doing a survey. You don't get the survey right the first time you do it. So you have to keep refining uh, the questions you ask, um, your approach uh, to customers, you know, how are you going to introduce yourself, how are you going to pitch your idea to them when you yeah. only have a short of, uh, amount of time. Uh, so kind of building off of that, I would say also make sure uh, you're asking the right questions. So try not to be too open-ended. I think it's easy to just go with uh, something easy like, well, what do you think of this idea? Or what do you think of this product? Um, that's pretty generic, right? You could go a lot of different directions. To me, what I felt was the most important question for my product was... Well, what is your product and your business? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, what I'm currently working on is a little different than what I pitched uh, during Startup Hustle. My current product is an app called uh, My Professors. 
and it's an app designed for Sac State students, and it allows them to quickly look up their professor's uh, office hours, as well as their contact information. So it's like a more advanced and more accurate uh, school directory for, for the faculty. Great idea. Oh, thank you. And um, so, so I mentioned, you know, don't, don't be too general when you're asking your questions. And, and so again, the, the most important question I felt uh, that I should ask other students is, uh, would you actually use this product or, or download this app? And if they say yes, you know, I can go into more detail in that direction. I mean, what do you like about it? Uh, what don't you like? And if, if they say, no, I'm not going to download it, well, why not? Well, why doesn't this appeal to you? And I can go off in a different direction there. But, but that's the key, like, because the whole idea is to get more users, right? More customers. And the only way you do that is that they actually go out and use your product. So, so you really want to hone in on that with your questions. Um, my philosophy is a little bit different with uh, asking friends and family. I think that is okay to an extent, um, especially if they are in your uh, target market. Okay, not uh, depending on your product. You know, you might not have any family members or friends that are in your target market. But if they aren't, I think it, it is it is a good idea to start there and uh, get some practice in. Uh, doing your survey because it's, it shouldn't be as uh, nerve-wracking as uh, going out and talking to strangers, right? These are people you're friends with, they like you, I think, <laughs> and, uh, and they'll, they'll go easy on you, right? That being said, I think you should still be a little wary of the, the feedback they're giving you because they probably are more likely uh, to be nice and, and, uh, and not be 100% honest. Um, so yeah, try to target friends that, that are in your target market, the actual customers you want, if you can. And then in terms of talking to strangers, uh, one kind of funny little side note is when I did the Startup Hustle uh, last year and I did my customer surveys, I only talked to, to friends that were students, of course. And because uh, I'm, I'm a pretty shy guy, so the thought of going up to strangers like straight out of the blue and asking them to questions about my product it was really uh, kind of frightening to me but it was just like two months ago that I started actually going out and talking to, to complete strangers students at Sac State I would just walk up to them and and ask them you know uh, a few questions about uh, my product and um, uh, again it kind of goes back to that iterative process that I mentioned at the beginning where uh, I had to refine my technique as the day went on because the very first students I asked, I got rejected. They didn't want to talk to me. So uh, that, it's kind of a bad thing, but at the same time, it was good because it, that's pretty much the worst thing that can happen. Someone says no, right? And then if they say no, you just move on to the, the next student or, or the next you know, customer that, that you need to survey. So, um, so yeah, after that, you know, I got a, a few students to talk to me, and uh, and so yeah, so I just say go for it, do what you need to do to kind of mentally prepare if this is something that uh, also kind of worries you or, or keeps you up at night. At night, I don't know, but uh, yeah, just just go for it. So those are some of my tips. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Cool. That's it. Thank you. Right Thank you, Robbie. Yeah, I cool. <laughs> Um, okay, so that concludes our, what is this, week two? Week two uh, session. Next week, we are doing a session. It, it will actually be held at the Velocity Venture Capital uh, Renaissance Tower. And it's really cool. It's on like the 28th floor, and you can see like everywhere. And um, so next, next week, the session is like clarity. So we're all going to be giving a three-minute pitch um, that kind of synthesizes what we've learned so far and what we think we know so far about our business model and about our customers. And so tomorrow I'll be sending out some instructions on that and helping you prepare for that. Um, along with the, the first assignment still is like continuing to do these customer interviews. Um, so that's about that. Hey, you want to talk about parking real quick on that for people? Oh, at Velocity? Yeah, Velocity. Right.
Uh, oh, just look for it in the emails. Don't park in the Renaissance pow- parking garage because that closes at 7:30 and your car will get stuck. That's so fine. I have to. They close their parking garage at, oh. at that tower, but there's garages like right yeah. next door that you can park at. Okay. Um, and other than that, get on Slack, ask questions on Slack. Feel free to DM me. A lot of you guys have been yeah, doing that. Yeah, yeah. If you guys um, have like lessons learned or like shit that you ever came, like you guys didn't think you did, but you did, share that on Slack for everybody else because I guarantee you, like everybody else is going through the same thing. Please. Yeah. And how, how many people are working here at the end of the day? I am. He's in the office all the time. I'm oh, here yeah. pretty much. Um, there's another thing. I can't remember if on the entrepreneur guide that I handed you at the beginning, uh, we have a Tuesday session with Eric Knopf, a virtual session. Um, I can't remember if that was scheduled for this Tuesday or next Tuesday, but just look out for the email on that. Um, he had to do a, 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 cha- a time change, so it's probably going to be on a Wednesday instead. And I'm waiting for a confirmation on that. So well, that will come about, Somebody was saying that they... You have a Facebook marketing class. Do we get that? Is that free or? Uh, if, you're a ha- if you're a Hacker Lab member, uh, if you're a Hacker Lab resident member, you get all the all of those classes for free. Um, if you're a student member, you get a uh, you get a discount. Yeah. So but yeah, resident members take advantage of all the all the classes. It's like forty. It's like thirty. I don't know. Twenty thirty thirty dollars. Yeah. So. All right, good night. Thank you.